everyone. Welcome to the SEED Enterprise um, Resilience Workshop. A really, really warm welcome um, to you all. Uh, quite an early welcome for those joining from Europe and um, perhaps a late one for whoever's been up watching uh, what's happening in the States. Um, my name is Linda. I'm with SEED. Um, we're a partnership for sustainable development, supporting what we call eco-inclusive enterprises. So these are environmentally and socially focused enterprises, and we support those guys with grants, uh, with capacity and with ecosystem building. And we're currently active in, in Asia and Africa. Um, so you can check out seed.uno for more. And I've got two lovely colleagues with me on the call, Amanda and Louis. So feel free to reach out or chat to them if you wanna find out more about us. Um, so I'll be with you for the sort of coming hour and a half, hour and 20. Let's see if we can round off five minutes early to let you guys have a break before the next session. Um, but we're here principally to talk about the importance of resilience, um, which we see as sort of the flexibility to plan for change um, and withstand shocks. Um, we're gonna look at what enterprises can do to, to increase their resilience to external shocks, such as COVID, but they're may well be others environmental related or so. And here, um, some real life coping strategies as well. Um, I'll share some recommendations on uh, a report we've done around this on what non-enterprise actors, uh, such as intermediaries or uh, government can do to support such re resilience. And then uh, we'll do a brief tryout of our CEDA self-assessment self tool um, and draw out some reflections on, on future proofing business. Um, I'm joined by some really fantastic speakers. So we've got Max uh, Bulukowski, um, who we've, um, I hope he allows us to team, <laughs> to call him our key expert, um, but he's really policy analyst um, for the social economy and innovation unit in the OECD. He's joining us from Barcelona. Um, he's gonna look at how enterprises can play a kind of repair and transform role following crisis or maybe the COVID crisis. Um, we also have Fatsai Monyuki, um, who's based in Zimbabwe. Um, she's the co-founder and managing director of Kudiwa Waste and Energy. Um, she's gonna talk about the importance of looking after your team in a crisis and how operating in a volatile economy uh, prepared her well for COVID. Um, and then last, we've got Matthew John, uh, who's based in India, who's the managing director of Last Forest. And I believe he's also a co-founder of Keystone Foundation. And he's gonna talk a little bit about the importance of focusing on, on core business um, and continuously planning and, and moving online. Um, I just would love to see um, who's in the room. And let me also just mention, okay, that's not gonna work, I'll switch it out. Um, I just wanna mention as well, uh, for those of you guys, feel free to, to post in the chat as well, um, who you are. Um, so I just wanna see who's in the room here. Um, and for that, you'll need your mobile. So, uh, or you can jump on your computer um, and just uh, go to menti.com and punch in the code 243741. And then we'll have a bit of a sense of what the division here is between enterprises, um, investors, policymakers, intermediaries. And as I said, if for whatever reason you can't access your mobile or you're not on your computer, um, please feel free to also post a note in the chat introducing yourself and so forth. Um, so yeah, menti.com, use the code 243741. I love it. The first other. Good, we've got some others. We've got. I'm interested to know who the others are. Maybe you can post that in the chat as well couple of enterprises. 
So for I saw that a couple of people are still joining now. We're just doing a quick poll of who's in the room. So um, for that, you can go on your mobile to menti.com and punch in uh, the code 243741. And then we'll see who's here. I've got 27 people. I've got about seven responses, a bit more, eight, maybe a few more, and then we'll move on to stick to our, our schedule. Okay, so let's let's hope this is indicative of of the rest of you guys as well. So we've got a fair few enterprises. We've got um, some intermediaries. Um, got a bunch of people that are other. I'm very interested to know uh, what what they are, or how they class themselves. Um, and then got um, a small segment of policymakers as well. Cool. Thanks so much. Um, this is just a bit of a crowdsourcing of what resilience means to you before we turn it over to our lovely panel to shed a bit of light on this as well. Um, so this is just an open question. So same concept, you can go to minty.com um, and just enter um, some, some words or suggestions so that we can sort of see if we're on the same page here. So we've got flexibility. Anything else? Again, if you're not able to jump on your mobile or machine for bandwidth or other reasons, survival like that pivot, yeah. Talk a bit about that as well. A lot of surviving, thriving, yeah. Surviving, thriving, love it. Strength. Perseverance. User-centric design, interesting. Coping, yeah. Smart. Super. Thanks, that looks, looks really good. Um, thanks so much for that input, everyone. Um, now, Without further ado, um, let me turn it over to, to our first speaker, Max. The floor is your Max for 10 minutes or so to give us a bit of a sense of how the OECD is looking at resilience. Okay, hello, good, good morning everyone, good afternoon. It's a great pleasure to be here and um, I am, um, I'm very happy to and honored to, to be part of this in health uh, uh, discussion today. Um, so um, I'm coming from the OECD. Maybe, maybe many of you don't know what it is. OECD is an international organization. We're considered as a think tank for the government. And although we have only 37 member states that are members of the OECD, uh, we actually uh, manage about 450 international committees and working groups around all parts um, of the technical side, and we're involved and in, uh, we're working with uh, the governments of 120 countries. Just to give you an idea, per year we produce about 800 reports, and you can find a lot of this information online um, on our website. A lot of data is free, so you're very free to use it. What is it also <clears throat> important to know is that although we are um, considered like very much centered around Europe and uh, uh, and the uh, you know and, and very developed countries. We have dedicated programs also to work in Asia and in uh, in Africa, in Latin America. And uh, for the last four years and a half, I've been actually leading and coordinating the effort around the SMEs in Southeast Asia. So uh, a lot of my background comes from there. Um, so currently I'm uh, placed in the center for small medium enterprises of the OECD. And uh, what is important is that we have been actually working a lot on the impacts of the COVID. And we're currently developing a number of uh, very relevant policy notes. The most uh, recent one was about the social economy and COVID and about the roles that social economy can play. When we say social economy, we don't necessarily mean 
NGOs, we also mean actually social enterprises, which could be for profit making and, uh, and cooperatives and others. And uh, um, clearly we've seen that a number of uh, governments have taken a very interesting approach to support enterprises and SMEs uh, across the world. But what is coming very relevant maybe for this discussion and for this resilience is that specifically social enterprises um, it, uh, become a kind of a key element of the uh, resilience because of two reasons, basically. First of all, because they have this repair function, and this is part of their DNA. This is something that they have been uh, doing because of their raison d'etre. That's why they really wanted to, they are, they are created. So very often during the crisis, they are playing a very important role in uh, supporting the, the health services, care services, supporting some of the disadvantaged, but also they have a, a, a transition, uh, they have a transformational function. And this is something uh, which I wanted to highlight the specific function of this kind of social enterprises. It is important because uh, this, uh, um, the particularity of this transitional um, function is something that makes precisely resistance work. First of all, uh, this, um, this resilient uh, function is created by the fact that um, some of the uh, social enterprises or pro-environmental enterprises, they're also part of this uh, sub-segment, they can create a systemic change following the crisis. Uh, because they can transform the system, they change the way we operate, they find the new uh, ways we operate. And then what is interesting, that's interesting for policymakers, that's what we keep on telling them, they can also help you uh, to cut the future costs. Um, that's something that an element that people don't necessarily always take into account, but because of this transitional function, they can avoid governments spend more money in the future. And this is, it's not about uh, making things doing them cheaper, but it's really about avoiding future costs. Um, so, Specifically looking at the uh, SMEs and environmental enterprises and, uh, and why the governments should support them. And uh, I wanted just to give several ideas before this discussion uh, that goes. First of all, as I said, uh, these enterprises can, uh, can support the transformational function of our society in the future for the, for the, for the better. Uh, and that's why the policymakers have to be involved. And um, uh, another uh, interesting element that we have also discovered is uh, that um, this very often social enterprises are very much involved in the experimentation. And experimentation is another element that allows us to change the models and uh, change the, the functions that could, could work, create new business models about the way we consume things or we produce things, and, uh, and uh, ideally demonstrate an economic potential of these new models. Very often, this idea start at a very low level, at a very uh, basic level, and then they are picked up by larger companies. Um, currently, uh, OECD actually works on a specific policy brief, uh, looking at the specific elements of the circular economy and post-COVID crisis, and this brief will be available very shortly around March. Um, now, speaking about the kind of um, what policymakers maybe can do uh, in terms of uh, supporting uh, this, uh, these functions. Basically, uh, there are uh, several big areas where policymakers can get involved. First of all, it's about sharing information. And sharing information also means developing some toolkits, developing ways uh, how policymakers can improve policies. Um, at, uh, I wanted to share just one example called uh, Net Regs. It's a, it's a very uh, well-known Scottish uh, um, kind of online tool where companies, SMEs, can freely uh, uh, check what, how they can improve their, uh, their performance, how do they cope compared to the other enterprises. Uh, secondly, thing what people, what governments can do is to provide, of course, capacity building and and uh, sharing information. This could be done through various forms through dedicated voucher schemes, through dedicated support to business centers and, and, and others, how to companies can improve their business models. Um, 
Thirdly, uh, it's about providing direct financial support. Of course, it's about giving grants, for example, or loans, at low um, at, at preferential conditions or not even, uh, to improve their production capacities, to improve their um, kind of a way how they can uh, uh, they can improve their uh, their operational sites. It's also, so another element is about access to market. And uh, that's where we see that public procurement uh, could be a, a real tool for many governments to, to play a role. For example, by including in um, kind of environmental clauses into the public procurement, that's something that governments can do. Be careful, uh, we always advise governments to, to, to do it very carefully. It could be a huge source for corruption. So it needs to be only done it, when a certain level of um, uh, stability maturity of the governance systems is in place and uh, through a development of regulatory tools and standards to which government uh, companies can uh, you know can adhere it's also um, so uh, a number of these elements have been uh, put in place and just very very uh, last point because i'm conscious of time is that when we speak about uh, greening of enterprises. There are two types of green enterprises. On one side, we speak about green innovators. This is about um, companies that really produce new models, new, new ways and new approaches. But also, it's a lot about green performers. And green performers are organizations that are actually trying to make the existing systems efficient and, and, um, and more eco-friendly. And uh, when we speak about policymakers, we actually should think about these two sub segments because approaches might be very different to each of them and uh, their justification might be very different. Um, Valia, I'm, um, I will stop here. I think it's uh, just a very, very uh, short uh, introduction to where, where we are. Uh, to say again that uh, we will all need to learn how to live and to improve the resilience of companies. There's a lot of research in this. And uh, you're very welcome to contact me or to my, my colleagues. I would be very happy to put you in touch because we have colleagues working on this from the environmental section, from the SME section, from the uh, social economy section. So thank you very much. Thank you, Max, also for taking time out on your holiday to speak about this. It just shows how important you find it. So thank you. Uh, and please, everyone, do reach out to Max if it's uh, useful. Check out this net rights and, and some of these publications. Um, if nothing comes of this, um, at least some collaboration or some connection, I think would be would be fantastic um, already. Um, I'll turn now to to Fatsai, um, and you'll have to unmute Fatsai to to speak to us, um, who is going to share a little bit about um, how COVID affected uh, Kudua waste. I've got an echo, but I'll mute myself um, when you myself. speak, Fatsai, and maybe we when can sort it that way. Maybe you can kick us off by talking about how COVID affected your business. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to this platform. My name is Fatsai Monyoki. And from Kudua Waste and Energy Solutions, we call it Quest. It is an inclusive organization that recycles plastic waste material uh, to building material. Okay, so we started operating in 2019, which was a very challenging which was very challenging. I hope you can hear me. But si, we're having some trouble. I'm just wondering if I should over, turn it over to Matthew first. Um, Matthew first. Uh, oh, you sort out your, your connection. How's that? Your connection. How's that? No, it's okay. Oh yeah, okay. I think we, we I might have you back now. So I don't know whether you were finished there on how uh, how you were affected by COVID. I don't think you were. No, no, I wasn't finished. Okay, please continue. 
Okay. Um, so in 2019, when we started operating, we have very challenging year, um, economically challenging year. We're really looking forward to a um, wonderful 2020. But of course, that's when COVID came. And um, we had a lockdown, a mandatory lockdown in our nation. Can you hear me? Yep. Are you able to hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, we are yeah, that's high. Uh, Sorry uh, to yes. interrupt you. It's just um, I'm trying to turn off your camera so that our connection is better because we have troubles um, hearing you properly. Is that okay? Yes, that's okay. Okay. This perfect. is much better. Let's do it this way. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Uh, you can now hear me. Can you hear me? I should suggest we give it one more go. If it doesn't work, I, I might turn it over to Matthew. Okay. Um, can you hear me though? Yep. Yep. Okay, so let me continue. Um, we had a mandatory lockdown um, for about eight weeks here in Zimbabwe. And um, we were not allowed to go out. So that meant that we couldn't produce, we couldn't deliver our orders, we couldn't make sales. Um, and, and we still had our obligations to meet our financial obligations, that is the salaries and the rentals and every other um, financial obligation. Uh, we also lost our target market, which were institutions, um, because two institutions such as schools and uh, colleges are still closed, they are unable to open. So we had to come up with coping strategies, survival strategies. And, and how uh, did you do that? <laughs> okay, I, I missed, um, one of our, so our survival strategies was uh, teamwork. We rallied our team and we communicated. That's what we did. We formed a WhatsApp platform to talk to our team that included our employees and uh, management. Okay, I think we've lost Fatsai altogether. Um, maybe we can get her back. I guess it's the uh, reality. instead of being uh, reactive. Yes, and we wanted everyone to know the reality on the ground. So we asked the team to come up with ideas on what to, in order to, to improve, in order to, to survive and to be resilient during the COVID-19 um, lockdown. And uh, the team uh, suggested that focus on active work, um, that was work such as accounting and um, marketing to make sure we went out in full force in our use of social social platforms uh, such as WhatsApp because the majority in our nation is on WhatsApp. So we advertise ourselves, we would, we would um, make ourselves um, present, our presence would be felt. And uh, we also make sure um, that we try to come up with the website, which is uh, still in the process. And also the team suggested that we build a shed outside so that as soon as the lockdown was over, we would need to work inside, but we would work outside. We would have free air circulation and uh, would be able to, 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 to 
instead of instead of recycling our air, we didn't work in 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 aerated a well aerated environment. So soon after the lockdown, we built shed outside and we started working outside with the, um, uh, the team so that I uh, would be able to work in a safe environment. Also made sure that we availed protective clothing such as um, the face masks and um, safe conditions such as sanitizing of hands for ever in the production site as a feature checks. And um, the team also suggests that we talk to our, um, our land owner, the property owner where we operate from, so that uh, we negotiate with him to go down, go down the range house. And it was a great idea because when we talked to the property owner, he actually uh, reduced our rent house by 75%, which is something which we're still enjoying even up to now because he has not yet increased the rent house. So it was actually um, a very good idea to us on, on, on finance. Um, our team also um, suggested that if the worst comes to the worst, because we didn't know when the lockdown would end. If the worst came to the worst, then they would slash. Um, then we could slash their salaries. But fortunately, uh, it didn't. It it didn't uh, take that long. What we decided to do rather was to move the salaries from being um, time based. Like we used to pay per month from being time based to being production based, so that we pay as as per productivity, as per the production. So um, with the ideas which we implemented and they helped us to survive, we saved on money and um, a lot of other things. And also, we we showed. Uh, our team that we can. And it also really helped, the communication really helped because it made everyone understand what was on the ground. It was different from just dictating and telling people that we're slashing your salaries or we are now changing them to being production based or we just can't operate anymore. At least everyone understood, everyone was real as instances. Thanks so much. And, um, <laughs> thanks so much, Fatsai. Yes. I think because um, the line is not so good, I think we, we might um, leave it here, but I think you made some really good points around. Maybe you can mute yourself, Fatsai. Sorry. While I recap. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, around, I, I guess, um, really involving the team and the transparency that you guys put in place in terms of uh, not dictating, but really uh, coming up, I guess, bottom up with, with solutions uh, or survival strategies. Um, and I think you make some really interesting points there around uh, financial resilience and what you, you put in place there as well. Um, so thank you so much for that. Um, if there's anyone interested in connecting with Fatsai, please feel free to drop her a note on the chat. I'll turn it over to you, Matthew, now. I hope your connection is a little bit uh, clearer. Uh, maybe you can kick us off with um, how COVID affected you and your business. Yeah, so um, just as a bit of introduction, um, so Last Forest Enterprises is based in the south of India, and we work with indigenous communities. Uh, based in mountain ecosystems. So it's a very unique uh, scenario where our focus is that the resources that are available with communities, uh, those are the resources that we should be able to utilize, value add, um, and take it out into the market. So the, so the core mission um, of the organization being to, to uh, pioneer many of these things because uh, you realize that in such a context, uh, there is a huge need to be able to find solutions and connect uh, communities and markets. So in short, pioneering, so our, our mission statement being pioneering sustainable living choices by connecting communities and markets. 
So in this sort of a context uh, where you are based and for, uh, on natural resources uh, and you are based in a in a space where uh, the economy is highly tourism dependent, uh, when the pandemic hit, um, it was really down to zero revenue. But uh, what was interesting was that even before the lockdown took place, um, we sort of took cognizance of the fact that, uh, that there may be a complete turnaround. And so we had team meetings even before, before the lockdown started in our country. What was very interesting was that um, uh, we got the board involved um, in our process along with the team. And it was fabulous the way the board was able to make some assumptions and the assumption right up uh, in early March was let's look at next six months, zero revenue and how you are going, how the organization is going to be able to, to go through this. I think that was a, that was a phenomenal point because you then had to look at what were your fixed costs, primarily your rentals and your salaries. Um, and see how you will raise finances either through loans um, or um, uh, from, from different sources and to be able to see out uh, the, the next six months. What that allowed us to do was that every pie that came in then was, was a plus plus. Um, so so that, was, that was a key starting point. The, the other couple of things that come to mind, which were very important was that Though we were, uh, the, our access to markets was limited, we pivoted on certain products, products that we were not making earlier or we were not producing earlier. So we moved to a space which was face mass, which was the need of the hour. And within a few weeks, we were able to work with a local group and produce close to 20,000 masks, which when were either sold or people gave grants to be able to distribute them to frontline uh, teams. I think that energized the team tremendously because you had then a sense of purpose at that point of time when, when all other sources of revenue were, uh, were looking very bleak. Uh, another thing that happened was that we had moved on to an e-commerce platform and this time allowed us to focus on that. So we, we took to social media in a big way um, and our e-commerce went up 5X uh, during the first three months. Uh, that allowed us then to again have a source, a revenue uh, stream coming in when most other uh, streams were dry, especially the retail scenario was zero. Uh, um, and, and at that time, I think the, the biggest support that we got was from customers. Uh, we kept our e-commerce site open and uh, customers waited even a month to get products delivered. I think it was their way of providing solidarity uh, to the team, uh, to small businesses, to social enterprises that we are there because at, at such times, logistics was, was, a, was a game that you never knew what the next day would bring, you know? Uh, and at that time, we were able to carry on and go forward. We had to, we had to take tough calls uh, at that time. And I think they were some of the toughest calls as a business because we had to, we had to shut down one of our establishments, which meant that we had to let 10 people go um, but what that happened was rather than the fixed cause of that unit cannibalizing the rest of the organization and bringing the entire organization down, it allowed the rest of the organization to survive. So it's been a tough decision, but I think in, 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 in the context of what we've seen over the last six months, I think that was one, a good decision that the board along with the team was able to make. I think some of these, these were some, some key uh, lessons that we took out. It meant that we did not let go of our core products. We pivoted on, onto new products. And when in June, by the time the, the country started opening, 
uh, we were ready because we were not zero revenue at any point. And so we were able to continue and then latch on to the, to the uh, opening economy. Yeah. Thanks so much, uh, Matthew. And I think that's a good illustration of um, where your model and the, the product service model kind of allowed for the flexibility, but also acting early. Uh, and I guess a lot of people yeah. or a lot of enterprises were, weren't um, blessed with, with a board or the foresight that you guys had. Um, have, I have one question which can be taken by any of the, the three speakers. Um, uh, someone just asked whether you think that any lessons from the pandemic can also be applied or will be relevant uh, for any climate crises. I don't know if, or if any of you have some thoughts around that. Can I respond? Yes, please. <laughs> so our products, um, our, our forest produce, and forest produce are completely dependent on climatic conditions. And um, is, we've not seen that it's not been yesterday, but it's been over the last eight to 10 years where we have seen the, the, uh, the climate has been so unpredictable. So you can go from a production of 100 down to a production of zero the next year. And you have to be so you are not able many times to make a business plan, which is you know based on on linear growth because you are highly dependent on natural uh, resources, and at that time you have to be able to see how either you can diversify your sources of supply. That is one. Number two is to be able to uh, take products and value add. Um, if you value add, you are able to, for the, uh, for a unit price that you would have received, now you are able to receive at least 3x. Um, and when you do that, you are able to somehow deal with these um, uh, climatic uh, changes that are constantly taking place. It doesn't give you, it doesn't give you tremendous stability, but it allows you to ride over uh, these scenarios. Thanks, Matthew. So you have to find products where which, which you can value add when which you can survive through the year. So you can have a core product, which when you have a good supply, you ride on that and you become cash uh, cash rich. But you have another set of products which are able to see you through the year. Interesting contingency planning right there. I think Max, you've got your hand up as well. Um, yes, thank you very much. Indeed, I just wanted to uh, to build on uh, what Matthew mentioned is that indeed, uh, we live in a period where the pandemic actually has created an opportunity for a change, and we have to really seize it, because if we don't do it immediately after that, it will be a lost moment. And that's the right moment to create noise about it, to, to, to create awareness about the need for a change, and sharing uh, the, the alternative models which can go and, uh, and non-linear um, kind of development, more circular, uh, if we speak specifically about the, uh, the environment approach models. So I just wanted to, to say that this is the right moment to speak about this and to, to share this experience with policymakers and to make a push for that. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Max. A bit of urgency there as well. Thanks so much. Um, I want to talk now um, a little bit about our seed resilience report uh, and tool. I'm not going to talk about the severity of, of COVID. I think we're all living in and witnessing it. And I think Fadzai and Matthew illustrated it really well. But I will share one statistic from Andy, who I believe are kind of a very big part of this conference as well, which is that 42% of MSMEs worldwide now face potential failure within six months. Um, and I think Certainly within SEED, we, I have spoken to businesses that had a cash flow of a couple of weeks or a maximum a month. Um, and I think this is where um, you're really seeing uh, the, the issue or the, or the, the, I guess the absence of, of 
resilience within within businesses. Um, so the background to this particular report is that when the pandemic hit, um, Seed interviewed about or sort of did check-ins with 30 of our um, enterprises. And we found that, I mean, unsurprisingly, um, those guys were strongly affected by um, especially the economic shock of, of the pandemic. Um, but some enterprises have been able to stay afloat uh, by leveraging their assets, their capabilities, their networks, uh, their local relationship, um, and in order to continue addressing the needs of, of communities, uh, while others haven't. Uh, and this is really where we see resilience come in. Um, so what we did is we identified sort of six dimensions or factors that determine how resilience an, uh, an enterprise is. And I can briefly talk through these. So uh, business resilience. So this is um, can be witnessed in enterprises um, through pivoting to provide new products and services needed by the market or by building kind of a diverse, diverse product service mix so you can easily switch uh, between these uh, to the point that, that Matthew was making really. Um, resilience, we also saw uh, through enterprises adapting distribution models. So obviously in the context of COVID, many enterprises um, you know, had issues with not being able to, to access their usual transport modes. Um, so they, a lot of them found ways to reduce dependency on face-to-face -face distribution or public transport by either bundling deliveries or, or moving to digital distribution uh, platforms. Um, and I guess we've seen qu uh, quite a few of, of our guys, uh, and I'm sure you've seen it too, switching also to indeed um, more health related uh, products. So really kind of tapping into where the, the needs of the market and where the urgency was there. Um, financial resilience. So. I mean, our guys are, are eco-inclusive or seed supported businesses are pretty used to operating in financially strapped environments. Um, but so I can probably talk <laughs> more to that as well, what it's like in, in Zimbabwe where you're looking at um, yeah, big fluctuations. Um, but so a lot of them are kind of used to their customers, their suppliers or distributors being affected by, by shocks. Um, but that means that some of them um, developed capacities in adjusting their pricing and payment conditions uh, and were able to discuss with partners ways for the enterprise to pay in smaller installments um, or to, to kind of yeah delay payment um, either with with business partners lenders uh, or in the I guess which was what Fatsai was talking to um, to look at sort of solutions within the, the team um, organizational resilience so COVID-19 has obviously accelerated digitalization within practically every organization and our eco-inclusive enterprises are no different. Um, but I think uh, the guys that are doing well, uh, they're really understanding the digital aspects of their key activities. So they moved um, services such as sales or marketing, logistics or operations online uh, using either kind of freely uh, available tools or, or customized. And those, um, that kind of lack digital skills or channels, obviously were, were much, much worse off. Um, there was a question, I think in the chat also about, well, what about the guys that are not, that don't have internet? Um, I mean, that's one of the recommendations in the report also uh, to governments is to really look at key infrastructure because I think internet and access to the internet is no longer sort of a nice to have, but it's kind of key infrastructure for businesses to be able to do uh, the work, uh, but we've also seen sort of more um, mobile data type solutions uh, come in. Uh, we've also within Seed, we've sometimes actually paid for or supplied our enterprises uh, with internet so that they're at least able to take part in in training um, and try to get around some some of those issues. Um, ecosystem resilience. So. Um, this is really about the enterprises that can rely on business partner and ecosystem actors for support in this critical period of time were much better off. So those that are really embedded um, and were able to kind of have strong partnership across their value chain, um, that can really soften the blow. Um, so yeah, the point being that enterprises that have uh, strong links into their ecosystem are, are much better off in terms of uh, weathering crises. Market resilience. So this is about the the impact of the pandemic um, of the of the um, so the impact of the pandemic was obviously um, varied a bit across sector, location, and production sites, uh, but also geography. So 
again, um, you know, some enterprises faced really severe limitations uh, in the countries from where they source their materials uh, or in terms of reaching kind of target markets. And I, in, in the main, what we've seen is that those guys that are operating locally and really embedded in their community and that are either sourcing their material or have very short lines um, to their, their customers are, are um, less heavily affected. Um, so obviously those that are uh, depending on international value chains are not. And this is obviously a clear case for a much more local uh, operation uh, when it comes to, to crises and resilience. Uh, and then finally, um, when it comes to impact resilience, so um, this is, we've seen a lot of our guys responding to the crisis by actually supporting their, or being able to keep supporting their beneficiaries. So some of them, uh, made actual efforts to to make like donations or to look at sort of free or subsidized product or service opportunity. But those that were better able to stay connected with their beneficiaries could could continue to deliver for them. And again, obviously, those that are um, able to to operate more locally or that are able to go online, for example, to serve customers in in these socially distanced time, um, were much better off. Like we. But also, um, just to give an example, we have a Ghana-based enterprise that actually um, sends farmers um, like uh, farm-relevant updates, I would say, or agriculture-relevant updates around weather and so forth. Uh, but those guys actually uh, started also broadcasting health messages. And in that way, we're kind of able to add, have a value add in terms of an enterprise in, in these particular times for their, uh, for their customers. Um, maybe very, I'll very briefly touch on this. I won't go into depth, uh, but, you know, support organizations are obviously absolutely critical to increase uh, the resilience of eco-inclusive enterprises. Um, they have a key role in identifying needs for financial, you know, um, support, obviously to, to, um, help with peer support and skill and skill building as well. Um, so, I think by supporting enterprises, um, you know, and help them develop some of the value and building in the value into their model, uh, they can really stimulate uh, recovery and, and resilience in, in communities. And I think Max also talked to this. Um, but through the work with some local partners, we identified also a couple of recommendations for how policymakers and intermediaries can support uh, resilience. Um, so you can find all of those on, on our website, but just maybe to touch on a, a few. Um, so to the point of a supply chain building, um, that's really hard, uh, as I'm sure some of you on this, on this call can testify. It's, it's very hard to kind of tap into uh, supply chain and build them uh, locally. It's a lot of work to go it on your own. So this is also where uh, local authorities or uh, and, and sort of networks or associations can come in to help build such uh, supply chains so that more of you can benefit. Um, this is also about skills building for enterprises that are really in, in rural areas. So we're seeing that a lot of um, you guys are, um, you know, a lot of the support is available in the cities and not in the rural areas. And especially in times of COVID when you can't travel, it's, it's even more important that the skill building sort of come or the capacity building comes um, to you. Um, for intermediaries as well, I guess a lot of this is about um, helping uh, from the get-go uh, enterprises to think about how they can uh, look at product service mixes um, and how they can diversify their portfolio or help pivot uh, when, when that's needed. Um, and then I think we, uh, I'm going to just really briefly touch on this because I want to get to our, our breakouts in time. Uh, obviously, this is a lot about finance, um, we, you know, this finance needed, um, you know, there's uh, governments can obviously apply or ask um, lenders to to get to provide tax breaks uh, or to or help restructure debt. Um, they can also provide a government guarantees to kind of de-risk uh, low interest or sort of emergency loans. Uh, might also think about some sort of crisis insurance fund uh, for COVID, but it can also be for climate crises. Um, for intermediaries, I think it's key that they share information uh, because a lot of enterprises don't actually know what they're eligible for. Um, and then um, lastly, maybe a short point on 
procurement and formalization. So, um, you know, obviously it, uh, for governments that are working with enterprises to prioritize, um, pay, you know, paying enterprises either possibly upfront or, or at least sort of as the first ones. Um, so that they don't go under if they are reliant on government products. Um, and then also, obviously, there's a lot of really small enterprises that are not formalized and therefore are missing out on any kind of support. So this is where intermediaries can also come in to help um, formalize uh, structures um, so that they can actually access support. Cool, maybe a brief word on tools. So at SEED, we're always working with, with tools. So what we do is we work with local partners to equip enterprises to start um, and build up their enterprises. And we often do that um, in a kind of show and tell way. So we try and give enterprises the tool to work through certain models um, or, or business processes. Um, so that's kind of at the heart of, of what we do. Um, and so when the crisis hit, we did a number of, of um, sort of workshops with our guys um, to help, for example, with scenario planning. So looking at market trends, um, and looking at what COVID might do, um, uh, you know, what the effects might be, and then really think of different scenarios, um, adapting business plan to address the scenario and to really come up with some contingency plans. Um, and this can be around, uh, it can be financial, can be around the team, can be about product service, um, et cetera. What I wanted to do though um, here is to talk a little bit about um, what I, we've loosely termed our resilience tool, but really it's just an Excel. Um, so this is just um, basically uh, an Excel sheet with the different dimensions. So the six dimensions I, I, men I mentioned, so business financial resilience, and just um, for an enterprise to be able to score from one to three, uh, how they think they rank on that dimension, and then see um, a little bit, um, and it looks like this, where they are strong in terms of, uh, resilience and where they're not so strong. And really what it just does is just serves to start a bit of reflection within the organization as to what um, what resilience might be for you and which dimensions of them might be important and how you can uh, strengthen those. Um, so um, my colleague Lewis um, will, I think, post in the chat the link to where you can uh, jump in and, and download this really simple Excel tool. And what we wanted to suggest for the next sort of um, 15, 20 minutes is to jump into breakouts uh, of about four people. I think Sankalp is gonna help us with that. Um, and just take, um, and just um, go with the four of you through this spreadsheet, just put a couple of numbers and look how it sort of pans out and have a bit of reflection around what that might mean. I would suggest that you take one case and if you've got an enterprise in the breakouts, then I would sort of take maybe their lead or their example, um, but uh, you know, you don't have to. And then maybe they, you know, you can um, square, share your screen around that or just explain a little bit um, uh, what, uh, what you're doing there. Of course, maybe not all the dimensions are relevant. So feel free to drop off any that are not, not relevant for you. Uh, but yeah, just to have a bit of a play around. And really, what I, as I said, what it serves to do is just um, create a bit of reflection with you and hopefully help you think a bit differently about resilience. So over to you, Sankalp, to, um, um, to put us in these groups. And my colleague, Lewis, and I will jump around a bit to see if there's any uh, need for explanation or so. Super. Thanks so much, everyone who's remained with us. Um, I think we've lost a few people on, along the way, but um, I guess that's to be expected. Um, thanks so much for those that were joining the, the, the breakout groups. Um, just seeing if there's any uh, reflections or feedback, feel free to pop it in, um, in here. So menti.com using the code 243741. Um, but I'm also going to ask uh, if there's anyone that has any uh, reflections uh, based on discussions or, you know, anyone that kind of uh, had a couple of ideas for uh, what they might do on, on their sort of intermediary or business level when it comes to resilience. Um, maybe there's a, a couple of reflections that we have from, from the groups. Um, feel free to turn your camera on and unmute or 
as I said, pop it in this uh, forum or send it in the chat as well. Let's see if that works. Um, I mean, in terms of like, I don't know anything on ease of use, anything that's uh, that you felt was missing in terms of the different dimensions for fee to put it here, because I think the way we work, we always try and improve a bit about uh, improve on on the different tools. Uh, maybe, I don't know, uh, Luz, if you can say a word or, or Matthew in terms of the discussion in your group, maybe there was just a show and tell uh, anything to to reflect back on there anything to share so yeah the group discussion um was mainly um about um well between penelope and and james and they were mm -hmm. in yeah renewable energies and um well the eco-inclusive sector let's say and um what was interesting was that penelope mentioned that um it was basically um a good kind of like a map or a canvas of things that you would usually struggle with um, visualizing or just seeing as a whole thing and then um, yeah performing or like going through the the questions looked like um, it could actually be a good tool to simplify um, and then visualize um, things yeah yeah great Penelope or any other to to add anything as I said, feel free to also just put it in the chat or... Hello? Hi. Hi. Um, I, as a startup pre-trading, mm. um, mm. we are designing our product and services at the moment. And um, it's going to be an interesting way of looking at that side of the business. And are we building something that's going to last? Mm. Or are we not going to learn from COVID-19? So it's something that we're doing, but it's not something we focused on. And it's why I came to this, um, mm. this session was to get a way of looking at it. And that's what you've done. So thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much. Good. I'm glad we're able to make a few changes here and there. I'll just turn it over to here. Um, feel free to send anything in here or just unmute. Uh, but otherwise, I think thanks so much for the share back. Um, as I said, any ideas, collaborations or suggestions uh, do turn over to Menti um, and um, or contact us directly. Uh, and maybe as a, a final thing, uh, maybe I can ask you all to uh, just turn your cameras for those guys that are still here. Um, turn your cameras on uh, and just say sort of a, a goodbye and hello to everyone. Maybe we'll take a small group picture if we can, if you can turn your, um, your cameras on just for a quick goodbye. And then I'll thank you all of you for joining our session. Thanks, Larry. Thank you. Thank you. Here we are. Good. Maybe yeah. Amanda, we can take a, a picture. I don't know if you guys are still Let's... with us. Oh, I think we've lost a lot of us, but okay, we'll do. Thanks, Paul. <laughs> Thanks, James. <laughs> Thanks, Sankop, for organizing. Yep. All right.